Humanity by James People and Garrick Bailey. Chapter 5, The Development of Anthropological Thought. Anthropology developed out of the contact between Europeans and the rest of the world. Even earlier than the four voyages of Columbus in the 1490s, horses and camels took Europeans to the Middle East and parts of Asia. After Columbus's discoveries, ships carried Spaniards, Portuguese, English, French, and Russians to the two Americas and to remote islands of the Pacific Ocean. There, Europeans contacted people who did not look, act, and look, think in familiar ways. A few European intellectuals struggled to understand these peoples and their primitive ways of living. Between the 1500s and 1800s, most European interpretations were based on the Judeo-Christian worldview by the last few decades of the 19th century. Advances of knowledge and the emergence of, of the scientific worldview resulted in new ways of understanding humanity and all our variability. And then did anthropology became an independent field of academic study. When it first emerged, cultural anthropology was distinct from other fields because of its focus on the peoples and the culture and cultures of other non-European lands. And with other non-Western cultural traditions, increasing contacts between Europeans and other peoples brought new knowledge and curiosities. But this alone did not lead to the formation of a new discipline. In the 1800s, the expansion of European colonies in Africa and parts of Asia produced particular practical colonies in Africa and parts of Asia produced practical reasons to learn about and understand cultural differences. Many anthropologists of today call faraway people, peoples with diverse ways of living. The other in contrast to ourselves, the cultures of the West, as we say, although the world is problematic, other eccentric, other to whom? To us, of course, we use it in this chapter because it was it is a convenient shorthand for the non-Western peoples on which anthropology concentrated during its first century. The emergence of anthropology. Until a few centuries ago, the vast majority of the world's people had little knowledge of any region or any other culture other than the, the one into, into which they themselves were born. There were some exceptions in in the 5th century BCE, the Greek historian Herodotus wrote about the peoples of Persia, now Iran, northern Africa, and nearby regions. Much later in the 1200s, the Venetian trader Marco Polo reached China, then Cathay, then Cathay, traveling along the ancient Silk Road that connected Rome and China since before the time of Christ. Marco Polo's descriptions of his adventures in China made his book popular among the European literary elite. However, descriptions like those of Herodotus and Marco Polo were rare and often treated skeptically. Some parts of Marco Polo's account were so surprising to his European readers that many of them did not believe his tales such as the one about the Chinese burning black rocks as fuel. In the 1500s, the nations of Europe began to send large numbers of explorers, traders, missionaries, and military personnel to other continents during the next 400 years. Spain, Portugal, Britain, France, and other European nations established formal colonies in large parts of Africa and Asia and in most of the Americas. See chapter four. European visitors produced hundreds of written descriptions about the, the customs and beliefs of Native Americans, Asians, Africans, and Pacific Islanders from such books, articles, and letters sent back home. Europeans learned that previously unknown continents and regions were populated by people who were definitely other than their than 
other in their customs and beliefs. Between around 1500s and the mid 1800s, most Western scholars believed that in the essential accuracy of the story of creation recounted in the Judeo-Christian Bible. In the biblical account, Earth was only a few thousand years old. One biblical scholar claimed that Earth was created in 4004 BCE. Because God created everything in only six days, humanity was the same age as Earth itself. Furthermore, the biblical biblical creation story contained no explicit reference to any um, any land occupied by uh, the kinds of others that Europeans were encountering. Who were all these people of the Americas and Africa? How could Westerners think make think Western thinkers make sense of these people and their primitive ways of living? Did their existence challenge the worldview derived from Judeo-Christian techniques? The surprising discovery of two unknown civilizations in the New World across the Atlantic o Ocean caused debates. In 1519, Hernán Cortés encountered the Aztec civilization of southern Mexico. Temples placed atop atop steep-sided py stepped pyramids, broad plazas, complicated agricultural fields, and of course all the gold and other riches of the Aztec elite classes, odd Cortez and later Spaniards. Farther south, the Inca civilization existed along most of the length of uh, the Andes Mountains. When Spaniard Francisco Pizarro and his soldiers entered the Inca capital in the early 1530s, he met a ruler whom people treated like a god. These two civilizations might have challenged ideas that Europeans had about their own superiority, except that both were soon conquered by the Aztec and by Cortez in 1521 and the Inca by Pizarro in 1535. By the mid 1800s, others puzzled puzzles had sprung up. For example, people in Europe discovered human bones <laughs> and stone tools and other evidence suggesting that ancient peoples had lived on their own continent. In Germany's Neander Valley, a partial skeleton of a human-like creature was unearthed. Where the Neanderthals were the Neanderthal bones human, and if so, what did they mean for our understanding of humanity and especially ourselves? Europeans in the 1800s noted that many ancient tools were made of chipped stone. They later noticed a regular sequence of tool making. The earliest were made of stone. Some later tools were smelted of bronze and still had, still later iron was used. The sequence came to be known as the three ages, the stone age, bronze age, and iron age. Each age had a greater variety of tools than the preceding one, and the materials used in each st stage seem superior to those of the earlier stage. It looked like Europe was also once contained simpler, cruder peoples in North America. <clears throat> in the early 1800s, European settlers of Ohio and surrounding states commented on the existence of large earthen mounds, wondering who could have constructed these ancient monuments, certainly not the ancestors of the Indians who then lived in these regions. Of course, future work showed conclusively that Native Americans made the mounds. Their cultures proved to be about as complicated as those of Europe itself. Until the mid-1800s, the Judeo-Christian worldview framed most interpretations of peoples in other continents and archaeological remains in Europe itself. Perhaps those others of, excuse me, of other lands were the descendants of Noah's wayward son, Ham. Maybe they were remnants of one of the lost tribes of Israel. As some scholars claimed about the Polynesians, possibly the devil buried the Neander bones 
and prehistoric artifacts to undermine believers' faith. Whatever the spe whatever the specific explanation, the custom customs and beliefs of people who lived long ago or far away generally were interpreted in terms of the biblical account of world creation and human history. In the mid 19th century, evidence from geology and biology informed a new understanding of the world. These findings led to a whole new world view about earth, life in general, and human life. In particular, which is now accepted by the majority of scholars from all continents, geology and biology helped bring humanity within the grasp of the scientific worldview, in which human beings and human cultures are understood to be the result of some process that is entirely natural. In geology, James Hutton and Charles Lyell demonstrated that Earth itself is not, was not merely thousands of years old, but many millions. Today, geologists believe our plan, planet is about 4.5 billion years old. In biology, Charles Darwin revolutionized popular ideas about life on Earth. Rather than each point, plant, and animal being separ separately made by the creator, Darwin proposed that one species arose out of another by an entirely natural process. He documented this process in his 1859 book on the origins of species, Darwin's natural process of evolution. Dar evolution means that over long periods of time, one species changes into new species or into several new species. Some species die out altogether, leaving no descendants, but often before its own distinct extinction, a species changes, evolves into one or more new species. Thus, multiple new species evolve and eventually change into other species. Given enough time, all the diversity of life on Earth can be explained by this process of natural transformation. From simple beginnings, the natural process of evolution created all the forms of life that surround us today. All it takes are the slow accumulation of changes and time, millions and millions of years of time. When geology demonstrated the age of Earth, it showed that our world was old enough for diverse and complicated life forms to evolve from simple beginnings. Darwin's main impact was on biology and the field now called paleoanthropology. Darwin established the possibility that the human species evolved from an ape-like ancestor and has idea with his idea was confirmed in the 20th century. See chapter one. Darwin's ideas about origins and changes in the natural world also influenced how Western intellectuals viewed home human cultural as well as biological evident existence. If biological life forms evolved, then could cultural forms also have arisen through a process of gradual change. Simple forms of organic life had transformed into more complex forms of life. And obviously, in human existence, some scholars reasoned that more complex ways of life have developed, had developed out of the earlier, simpler ways of life. During these same centuries in Europe and North America, the Enlightenment Age of Reason and the Industrial Revolution led to belief in progress that no, that notion or the notion that human life has gotten better and better over the course of, of many centuries, the idea of progress in the realms of technology and ideas led to optimism about the human future. In summary, by the 19th century, a few scholars who wanted to understand human cultures had access to two major kinds of information. One, written accounts left by Westerners who visited other lands, including colonies of European nations. And two, 
tools that ancient long disappeared peoples from Europe and North America had left the, in the earth, influenced by Darwin's theories and the intellectual climate of the enlightenment. Scholars assimilated ideas about origins, evolution, and progress. They reasoned that there is a relationship between the various peoples in the written accounts and the ancient peoples who made the prehistoric tools and monuments. The long disappeared prehistoric peoples of Europe and the Americas were similar to the peoples described in the accounts of Western visitors to other continents. Just as stone tools were the earliest form of technology, so primitive peoples still alive in the 19th century were living representatives of earlier forms of culture. They thought that American Indians and many others were still living in the Stone Age. Here's the vocabulary word for this. <clears throat> 19th century unilineal evolution. Interested scholars began to investigate and theorize about how and why cultures had changed that over many centuries and millennia. Like plants and animals, cultures had evolved. The earliest simple so-called primitive cultures had risen, given risen, had given rise to ever more complex advanced cultures. The cultural evolution represented progress or development Later cultures were in some objective sense, superior to earlier cultures. Here, objective means that there is a universal standard by which superiority can be judged, an assumption that later anthropologists questioned. The approach of these early anthropologists is called unilineal evolutionism. At the time, founders of this approach could not have had could not have known that future generations of, gen of anthropologists would challenge most of their goals, methods, and conclusions. This theory briefly stated holds that as human cultures evolve, they pass through a series of stages. Examples of each stage could be found in the peoples described in all those written accounts of surviving primitives and also in the artifacts that prehistoric peoples had left behind in or on the ground. Although 19th century Western civilization represented the highest st stage of cultural evolution, peoples living on the other continents were cultures that had survived from earlier stages. The cultures of these people had survived into the present because they had changed at lower, slower rates than the cultures of more advanced peoples. Such peoples were living from relics, were living relics from humanity's distant past. Their cultures were survivals of earlier cultural stages. Their way of life had not changed much of humanity's deep prehistoric past. For example, the evolutionist, though, Thought to survival thought that survivals of the earliest stages of cultural evolution still existed in remote places like Australia and Polynesia. In 1877, the American Lewis Henry Morgan published Ancient Society, a book that integrated information compiled from written accounts of people from all continents. Morgan defined and labeled the stages he placed in, <clears throat> excuse me, he placed the Australian Aborigines and, Polyne and the Polynesians in savagery. As he labeled the earliest, simplest stage, remnants of later intermediate stages still existed in the people of the Fiji Islands of the Pacific and the Iroquois Native Americans. Both cultures are living representatives of the Middle Eighth stage of cultural evolution, which Morgan called barbarism. Elsewhere, later evolutionary stages exist. The Incas of the Andes and the Aztecs of Mexico, the Chinese, Koreans, and Japanese all had evolved to civilization. Thus, Morgan reasoned the earliest cultures 
were like the Australians and Polynesians. Later ones resembled contemporary Fijians and Iroquois and the Inca, Chinese, and some other ancient civilizations represented the earliest human civilizations. The highest stage was Western civilization by comparing peoples who exempl exemplified all the stages evolutionists believed they could reconstruct the nature of the various stages and figure out what had led one stage to progress to the next. Excuse me. The unilineal evolutionists are usually considered the first cultural anthropologists. They had a subject matter that was by and large separate from that of other disciplines. The cultures and societies of peoples who lived in foreign lands, the others, they had reasonably coherent objective to reconstruct and understand the stages through which human cultures had traveled along the road to civilization. They used a methodology that was then in its infancy, compared and contrasting diverse peoples to discover the nature of stages and the relationships between them. In brief, cultural anthropology became an academic discipline because it had its own subject matter, objectives, and methods. <clears throat> Consider one of the Consider another example of unilineal evolutionism. In 1871, the Englishman E.B. Tyler published landmark book, Primitive Culture. In it, he investigated the origins and developments of religious beliefs. Tyler argued that the religious be beliefs originated out of people's... I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on this so you can take a look at this. Love it when they do that. Out of people's attempts to explain certain experiences. For example, immediately after someone dies, the physical body still exists even though the life of the person has ended. What explains the difference between a living and a dead person? Being ignorant of the actual causes of death, early humans reason that living people have a spiritual essence, a soul that animates or gives life to the physical body. When the soul leaves the body, the person stops breathing and moving and hence dies. Also, people experience dreams, trances, and visions in which they seem, I'm sorry, when the soul, also people experience dreams, trances, and visions in which they seem, see images of all kinds of things and events reasoning logically but falsely early peoples concluded that the things and dreams and visions are real and that the events actually occurred tyler called the form of religion that this reasoning produces animism peoples of this early stage believe in spiritual being beings including nature spirits living in mountains trees water, heavenly bodies, and animals, spirits of deceased persons, ghosts, spirits that cause illness, spirits that possess possesses someone and make them insane, and a multitude of other spirits. Tyler thought animism was the earliest primeval form of religion from which all others arose. He reasoned that living peoples who still had animistic beliefs represent survivals of the earliest stage of religion. Therefore, scholars could learn about the earliest form of religion by studying living peoples who were still animistic. How did animism evolve into later forms of religion over time? Early peoples reasoned that some spirits were more important or influential than others. Eventually, people came to believe that such spirits held higher positions. They became gods of various things and activities such as gods of sun, moon, sky, rain, earth, clans, war, agriculture, love, fertility, and so forth. 
There were such there were many such gods as well known from Greek and Roman mythology and Hinduism of ancient India. This stage of religion is called polytheism, meaning religions that include a belief in many gods, which with his, her, or its own sphere or of influence. What about monotheism? The belief that there is only one God. This form represents by the Judeo-Christian Judeo heritage of the West. It was fam also familiar from Islam, which had been known to Europeans for more than a millennium. <clears throat> Tyler argued that monotheism evolved when one of the gods of polytheism acquired dom dominance over other gods. Eventually, over centuries, the other gods came to be seen as false gods or not to exist at all. Not surprisingly, Tyler believed that monotheism was the most evolved form of religion. Morgan's and Tyler's stages illustrate the main ideas of unilineal evolutionists. Examples of each stage survived in many scattered places, in fact, on all continents. One stage evolved into another, not just in one religion, or I'm sorry, in one region or continent, but in many. For example, animistic religions evolved into polytheistic religions among many peoples, and in turn, polytheism evolved and into monotheism several times. The fact that the same sequence of stages occurred again and again among widely scattered peoples seemed to imply that human cultures developed in regular reoccurrent patterns. If so, then human cultural evolution followed some sort of law meaning that similar processes were resulting in similar changes. Analogs to Darwinian, Darwinian evolution. A science of culture, excuse me, following the logic, most unilineal evolutionists thought that the new field of anthropology could and should be a science. They believe the development of the culture should be explained, could be explained much as biology explains the evolution of living organisms. Tyler, 1871, page two, wrote that human thoughts and wills and actions accord with laws as def definite as those which govern the motion of waves the combination of acids and bases, and the growth of plants and animals. Few anthropologists of today agree with this statement because unlike waves of, and chemicals, humans have active minds of their, owns, of their own. Many contemporary thinkers do not believe that Tyler's science of culture is possible at all. Some do not think it is even desirable because one kind of human should not treat other kinds of humans as objects for, of, for study. The unilineal evolutionists made significant contributions to the development of anthropology, thanks largely to their writings by the early, early 20th century, anthropology became a full-fledged academic discipline Scholarly fields that investigated various aspects of humankind were already established in European and U.S. universities as departments or schools of religion. Theology, art, philosophy, classics, history, anatomy, and so forth. But the disciplining, discipline focuses, focusing on the physical and cultural diversity of humanity was not recognized until the last decades of the 1800s. In the United States, the first anthropology course was taught in 1879 at the University of Rochester in 1886. The first anthropology department was founded at the University of Pennsylvania. It was followed near the turn of the century by the university departments at Columbia, Harvard, Chicago, and California in Berkeley. Anthropology thought 
anthropological, I'm sorry, anthropological thought in the early 20th century. I'm sorry about that. Despite their contributions as to the foundation of the discipline now called anthropology, many assumptions of the unilineal evolutionist were mistaken. In their early, in the early decades of the 20th century, most of their ideas were discredited partly because their methods were flawed. Much of their information was erroneous and their overall theory grew out of the eth ethnocentric views in the English-speaking countries. Anthropologists in America and Great Britain set out in different directions as we now discuss. Historical Particularism in the United States, 1900 to, through 1940s. At the end of the 1800s and for the next three or four decades, the American anthropologist Franz Boas and his students questioned the methods and the findings of a unilineal evolutionism. Boas was so influential that in the United States that he is often called the father of American anthropology. In his view, each culture has its own separate past because each culture was affected by almost everything that had happened to it during the, its history. Each is unique. The similarities that unilineal evolutionists had used to place various cultures into the same stages are mostly superficial. This approach is usually called historical particularism or historicism. Notice that if it is true that each culture is the distinctive product of its own, of its unique history, then it is difficult to identify any general pr principles that affect all cultures. Rather, each culture must be studied on its own terms. Clearly, the unilineal evolutionist, evolutionist did not study each culture on its own terms. In making their comparisons and formulating their stages, they imposed their own terms, e.g. complexity, progress, stages on other cultures. Take the notion of the complexity. For example, in the realm of technology, most people might agree that guns and bullets are more complex than bows and arrows which in turn are more complex than spears and throwing sticks. But what does, this, what does complex mean when applied to other customs and beliefs, like those about marriage, political organization, and or religion? In what sense are the religions Tyler called monotheistic more complex than animistic ones? Boaz held that such features are merely different from culture to culture. By any objective criterion, one form of religion does not represent progress over other, over another. <clears throat> there were other problems also. For example, Japan ranked as a civilization, but its indigenous religion was Shinto, which would be considered animistic. In a similar fashion, Polynesian had a complex system of gover governance but Morgan placed them in a savagery because of the names they called their relatives and their marriage practices. The coexistence of low stage traits and high stage cultures and vice versa suggests that there was more than one line of cultural evolution. Furthermore, Boaz realized that the evolutionist stages derived from the ethnocentric assumptions Evolutionists place their own culture at the top of the imaginary cultural leader ladder. Searched writings to find many others uh, whose cultures represented earlier stages, gave the stages labels like barbarism, slotted particular cultures into their own preconceived classification, and then concluded that they were discovering the laws of cultural development using the methods of science. As an example of Boaz's point, consider Lewis Henry Morgan, who assigned various peoples into stages he called savages, barbarians, and civilized. 
but many literate civilized people, including Japanese, Koreans, and Chinese, labeled Morgan's own peoples as barbarism. Is monotheism more evolved than animism or polytheism? Perhaps, but you are more likely to think so. If your own religion is mon monotheistic, if your criteria for de defining evolution are ethnocentric, then your concept of stages is almost uh, useless. You have not discovered actual stages of progress. You have invented them and then imposed the stages you yourself made up on the cultures of others. As a thought-provoking side comment, notice how often you can find unilineal thinking in scholarly writings as well as in popular media. The historical particular list also claim that it is a difficult to place the customs and beliefs of different peoples into the same stage of progress. In most cases, the customs and beliefs of widely scattered peoples only appear to be similar. For example, in Tyler's scheme, the ancient religions of both Greece and Polynesia had many gods and so would be classified as polytheistic. Tyler defined a stage of religion, polytheism, and placed peoples who believed in many gods into that stage. What would the ancient Greeks and Polyth Polynesians, I will pause right there so you can get the vocabulary word. What would ancient Greeks and Polynesians, not to mention Hindus, have said about each comparisons? Likewise, Muslims, Jews, and Christians are all monotheistic. But is this the single feature of their religions enough to place them into the same stage? How would members of these faith feel about this? In short, to say that the customs and beliefs of two or more other cultures are the same or similar because they look at the same to us is to ignore a host of differences between these cultures. The Greeks and Polynesians had different gods who did not, I'm sorry, cultures who did different kinds of things to do different kinds of things to and for people. For the historic historicist, this is enough to consider them different forms of religion carried to its extreme. Of course, this means that every religion has a different form from every other religion, which makes every religion unique. You could apply the same logic to individuals. Of course, we are all unique, but aren't the same individuals more alike than others to understand a culture. Therefore, Boaz thought we must study it individually, not as a representative of some hypothetical stage, anthropologists must free themselves from preconceived ideas and assumptions and give up speculative schemes and the fruitless search for laws of cultural progress. Boaz believed that unilineal evolutionists made errors partly because of their ethnocentrism. He also noted that the ways of evolutionists investigated other cultures their methods led them astray. Today, 19th century evolutionists often are called armchair arm anthropologists because they themselves had not lived among any savages and barbarians themselves. Lewis Henry Morgan, who actually studied the Iroquois nation, Native Americans firsthand, was a rare exception. Instead, for the most part, they relied on descriptive accounts written by people who too often were untrained, who represented their imp impressions rather than hard facts, and who were biased in their preconceptions of others, perceptions of others. 
Boaz thought that professional anthropologists must abandon the comforts of their offices and engage in firsthand interactions with members of other cultures. The main need of the young field of anthropology was more factual information about these cultures, not supported speculations made in faculty offices. Anthropologists themselves must con conduct ethnographic fieldwork. This was the only way they could be somewhat confident that they had their facts correct and only anthropologists were sure that their facts were correct should they begin to even try to make general statements or to theorize about cultures. Boaz, in brief, wanted more and be be um, better descriptions of more cultures. These descriptions require that field workers remain objective as they observe and record the customs and beliefs of their own of other cultures. Field workers must enter the communities and lives of others with an open mind. If they go into their research with the preconceived with preconceived notions, their observations and writings are likely to report things consistent of their own preconceptions and not to notice or report on contradictions. While doing their research, field workers should be cultural relativists. Chapter two, while living among others, we must temporarily suspend our own values, morality, standards of hygiene, ways of interpreting actions, and so forth. Not only does a relativist uh, attitude help us fit into the community, but also, it also minimizes the chances that we will misinterpret or misunderstand people just because we see them through the filter of our own culture's per perceptions and biases. Boaz himself conducted firsthand field work among two Native American peoples, the Inuit, Eskimo, and the Kuwaitol of the Northwest coast of Af North America. He sent many of his students at Columbia University out for field work experiences, including Margaret Mead, who became famous for her 1928 book, Coming of Age in Samoa. For decades, Margaret Mead was the one anthropologist most people knew about. Again and again, she discussed the dramatic differences among the peoples of the world, so much so that the idea of that there is a human nature became widely questioned. Mead also was one of the intellectual founders of modern feminism because she emphasized the multitude of differences in how cultures regard relations between sexes. Today, living among and participating in the lives of the people under study is the main method by which one becomes a professional anthropologist and acquires a positive reputation in the discipline. The emphasis of ethno <clears throat> on ethnographic fieldwork is one of Boaz's lasting legacies. In addition to learning more about cultures and their diversities, fieldwork others offers other benefits. The traditional customs, beliefs, and languages of many of the world's peoples had already disappeared because of diseases, genocide, assimilation, and other effects co of contacts and interactions. Surviving cultures and languages were vanishing or changing rapidly. Boaz believed it was the duty of anthropologists to record disappearing traditions before they are, were gone forever. Many students of Boaz, like A. L. Kroeber and Robert Lowy, did field work among Native American peoples whose cultures they believed were especially endangered. Finally, Boaz and his students conducted a lot of research to show that biological differences and cultural differences are largely independent of each other. That is, the culture of human group is a product of social learning and tradition, not of genetic heritage. See chapter two. Excuse me. In some historical particularism, 
made four enduring contributions to modern anthropology. It, dis it discredited the overly speculative schemes of unilineal evolutionists. It insisted that field work is primarily the means is the primary means of acquiring reliable information. It imparted the idea that cultural relativism as a methodological principle is essential for most accurate understanding of another culture. It demonstrated and popularized the notion that cultural differences and biological differences have little to do with each other. These contributions shaped modern cultural anthropology. Historical particularism gave rise to other movements in the first half of the 20th century. One of the most influential is called configure. I'm so sorry if I mispronounced that. Configure rationalism. One of Boas's students was Ruth Benedict whose 1934 Patterns of Culture is considered a classic. Benedict argued that from the vast array of humanly possible cultures, each particular culture develops only a limited number of patterns or configurations that dominate the thinking and responses of its members. Each culture develops a distinctive set of feelings and motivations that orient the thoughts and behaviors of its members. These configurations give each culture a distinctive style and the thoughts and actions of its members reflects its configurations. Here is the vocabulary word. And here's the picture. For example, Benedict wrote that the Kuwati of the northwest coast of North Af America were individualistic, competitive, and in 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 intemperate. This configuration affects the Kuwati customs. They, the stage ceremony, ceremonies known as the potlatches, in which one can go group gives away enormous quantities of goods to another. The aim is to shame the rival group for if it, the rival is unable to return the presentations on certain occasions, its members suffer a loss of prestige. To avoid this condition, the recipient group is obliged to return gifts of even greater value. The whole complex of behaviors connected to the potlatch reflects the culture, cultural configuration of the Kawati. The Kawati are so caught up in the prestige motivation that groups will give away large quantities of material wealth to achieve the value they place on prestige. To describe the Kawati, Benedict used the label as Dionysian. After the Greek god known for his drinking, partying, and other excesses, Benedict contrasted that Kowatl configuration to the Zuni of the North Af American Southwest. Zuni control their emotions, she claimed. They are moderate, modest, stoical, orderly, and restrained in their behavior. They do not boast or attempt to rise above their peers, but are social and cooperative. This Apollonian cultural theme, as Benedict called it, perme permeates all of Zuni life. Unlike the Kuwata leader, a Zuni man does not seek status. Indeed, a leadership role pr pr practically has to be forced on him. So according to Benedict, each culture has its unique patterns and themes, which makes it possible for the me mega Lomaniac in culture A to be mo a model citizen in culture B. Although modern anthropologists agree that different, excuse me, cultures emphasize different themes over patterns, most believe Benedict overemphasized the effect of culture on the thoughts, feelings, and actions of its members.
It is simplistic to characterize whole cultures in such terms, such as the Kawadi are prone to excess, whereas Zuni are moderate in all things, rather than personality and character of the members of a culture are highly variable. And the relationship between cultural knowledge and the individual behavior is complicated. See chapter two. Historical particularism changed the way anthropolo anthropologists thought about culture and conducted research, but it has limitations. Think about the claim that each culture is unique like no other. Certainly those interested in cultural differences will easily find them and excuse me, can legitimately claim that no two cultures are alike at some, at some level. The view that each culture is unique is correct. However, so is the claim that no two individuals brought up within the same culture are exactly alike, yet they are alike in, in some ways, just as it is true that in some ways cultures are unique. In other ways, given culture does have things in common with some other cultures. Most generally speaking, there are similarities as well as differences between the way between ways of life. Historical particularists tended to overlook the similarities and to neglect investigation of factors that might explain them. Consider also the claim that because each culture is the product of its particular history, one cannot generalize about the causes of cultural differences. According to historicism, there are no general causes of cultures, rather there are multiple causes whose relative importance is difficult to disentang disentangle. Besides, the causation varies from people to people depending on their particular history. Others disagree to say that the natural environment is important in culture X religion in Y, values in Z, and so forth, is to say little more than that everything is related to most everything else. However, it is possible that some influences are more important than other influences. In all or most human populations, for example, some scholars claim that how people interact with their natural environment is generally impo more important than religion or values in causing people to live the way they do. By the 1940s and 1950s, the interests of many American anthropologists returned to investigate, gating general principles of human cultural existence. Meanwhile, another way of studying human society and cultural diversity developed in Europe. Here is the vocabulary word. British functionalism, 1920s to 1960s. At about the same time that historicism was popular in the United States, <clears throat> a different approach developed in Great Britain, generally called functionalism. Its main tenant was the social and cultural features should be explained primarily by the, their useful functions to the people and to the society. That is by the benefits they confer on individuals and groups. Because humans are social beings who live in families, communities, and other kinds of organized groups, most aspects of their culture and society serve to help individuals meet their needs and or to contribute to the maintenance of the society itself. Bronislaw Malinsky was a leading British functionalist. He emphasized the needs of individuals to Malinowski, the main purpose of culture is to serve human biological, psychological, and social needs. What are these needs? Most biological needs are rather obvious. Nutrition, shelter, protection from enemies, maintenance of health, and if the society is to persist, biological reproduction. 
In addition, humans also have psychological and social needs such as love and affection, security, self-expression, and a sense of belonging. The purpose of culture is to fulfill those, these needs. Unlike other animals, humans have few inborn instructions or instincts that tell us how to meet our needs. Instead, as we grow up in our culture, we learn the behaviors, social rules, values, and ways of perceiving the world that guide our actions and our thoughts. See chapter two. In some parts of culture, meet individual needs directly, such as knowledge of how to acquire food or make shelter. Other aspects function to raise and socialize new generations as group members, such as enculturation practices and family life. Still others encourage people to adhere to group values and rules make that make cooperation possible, such as religious beliefs and practices <clears throat> and creative arts. Thus, even if a given culture feature does not directly serve individual needs, it still indirectly contributes to the maintenance of cultural knowledge and behavioral patterns without, each, without which human survival would be difficult. One cannot deny that an important function of culture is to help people meet their needs. However, in some kinds of societies, some individuals and groups have their needs and wants met more completely in, than others. Furthermore, culture itself can create perceived needs. You may think that you need something when you merely desire it, and the social and economic conditions under which people live make them need some things that people of other times and places did not need. If you are, were an attorney in Britain or a college student in India, in the 1970s, you would not need a computer, but you would today. If you are to be successful, finally, it is likely that perceived needs grow as the capacity for meeting them increases, as all economists know. Thus, the idea of needs is more of a problem than it appears. Needs do vary from place to place and time to time. Also, if we are interested in cultural differences, then the idea that the main function of culture is to satisfy the needs does not take us very far. If needs do not include ones, what we would like to have to make us happy, such as material wealth of social status, then needs are pretty much the same all among all peoples. Also, people living in different way, times and places satisfy their needs in a variety of ways. By themselves, universal needs alone cannot explain cultural differences. For example, eating beef will satisfy the nutritional need for protein. However, many devout Hindus and Buddhists not only refuse to consume cattle flesh, but also maintain an entirely vegetarian diet because of their religious beliefs. Most contemporary vegetarians and vegans do not consume meat because of health or moral considerations and or because their diet is as is an important part of their self-identity. A human body does not need meat to maintain health, so the universal need for protein cannot explain the many ways in which people acquire protein. To generalize this point, basic needs of humans are the same everywhere and can be satisfied in such a variety of ways that needs alone cannot explain cultural diversity at the very least. Differences in the natural environment that provides need satisfying resources must be taken into account. A.R. Redcliffe Brown, it was another influential British functionalist. Instead of emphasizing the needs of individuals, Radcliffe Brown focused on the needs of societies. For him, maintaining orderly social relationships between family members, friends, members of the same village or town, leaders and followers, and like is the main function that most 
must be met if societies are to exist and persist. He imagined that a human society is like a living organism in which each organ has a function to fulfill that contributes to the life of the whole body. In studying a body, a physiologist not only looks at each organ individually, but also considers its role in the life processes of the whole organism. Just as organisms cannot stay alive for long unless their organs function properly, so a, size, so a society cannot persist unless its various institutions play their proper roles in social life. Radcliffe Brown felt that most customs and beliefs of people share help their society remain in equilibrium, a steady state which not too much with not too much conflict or rapid change. From today's perspective, it is clear that societies are not analogous to living organisms. Individuals, individuals have minds and motives of their own, unlike cells and organs, and few societies are in equilibrium for very long. Societies change constantly. The rate of change and the direction of change vary, and functionalism had relatively little of lasting value to say about change. Despite these other shortcomings, British functionalists made enduring contributions to anthropology, emphasizing the importance of social relationships between individuals and of living in organized groups leads us to pay more attention up to how groups are organized and how they relate to one another. Radcliffe Brown's emphasis on social equilibrium led us to pay more attention to how the parts of, so of a society and culture fit together and therefore made us pay more attention to cultural integration. Fieldwork tradition, like the American history, Historicist, the British function, functionalist, helped establish the tradition of first-hand field work. Malinowski is famous for mainly because of his field work and ethnographic writings about the Trobriand Islanders of the Western Pacific. Some of his books, like Argonauts of the Western Pacific and The Sexual Life of Savages, are ethnographic classics. Not only is his, his field work the best means of obtaining reliable information about a people, but it is also necessary is it is also a necessary part of the training of anthropologists. Malinowski believed we cannot claim to understand people or the diverse cultures in which people of various places grow up until we have immersed ourselves in the experience of some culture <clears throat> other than our own. Malinowski thought the main objective of field work is to see the culture as an insider of the culture sees it. In an often quoted passage from his 1922 ethnography, Argonauts of the Western Pacific, Malinowski wrote, the final go goal of which an ethnographer should never lose sight is briefly to grasp the native's point of view, his relation to life, to realize his vision to, of his world. The idea of this, of what fieldwork is all about, remains influential through controversial today. To grasp the native's point of view, field workers usually make visits that last at least a year and they often return to the community many times. Also field work involves deep involvement in the daily lives of the people where possible field workers should master the native language, live with the local people, partic participate in games and voyages, become familiar with how members of families relate to one another, observe lots of ceremonies and rituals, record myths and legends, gen and generally learn all they can about a culture from interacting 
with people and participating in their lives. This way of learning about another culture is generally called participant observation, and it is most the most important method of many field workers. See chapter six. Because of the influence of early 20th century anthropologists like Boas and Malensky, today the fieldwork experience is, is, is an essential part of the grand, graduate training of almost all cultural anthropologists. Fieldwork demonstrates that you can do anthropology yourself as well as study the anthropological research and theories of your teacher and other scholars it demonstrates that you can contribute original knowledge about some group of others. And in most colleges and universities, making new contributions is essential for a success in one academic career. Until 20 or 30 years ago, most field workers were from either North America or Western Europe. So most ethnographic graphies describing the ways of life of diverse people peoples were written by Western anthropologists who, for the most part, were trained in Western universities. But anthropology today was gone global, has gone global. People of many nationalities representing many cultures are now, well, let me do that, I'm sorry about that. Let me go ahead and show this to you. And then here is the global anthropology so that you can take a look at that. zoom in on that so you can read it. Okay, okay so I'll kind of zoom in on that and start reading on this part. People of many nationalities representing many cultures are now anthropologists interested in writing about the very people from people whom Western ethnographers use to monopolize this. This has led to new issues and in the future, new ways of representing other cultures are likely to emerge. See the global challenges and opportunities feature. For many anthropologists, fieldwork is personally transformative even anthropologists have trouble overcoming their own biases and looking at others relative, relativistically instead of through ethnocentric lenses. After being intense, intensively exposed to another way of living, we often come away with a different perspective on ourselves. Fieldwork is the closest, most is the closest most of us come to dissolving the differences between us and others. This is another reason most professional anthropologists conduct field work, that and the fact that most of us like it. Mid 20th century, rebirth of evolutionism. The objections of the historical particularists to unilineal evolutionism are powerful but other evolutionary approaches came back to, into fashion in the 1940s and endure today. The problems with the old unilineal evolutionism were fl its flawed assumptions and inadequate methods. Some mid 20th century scholars thought they had corrected the assumptions and adopted more sophisticated methods. They developed a new evolutionism or neo-evolutionism, so-called because their objectives were much the same as the objectives of the 19th century evolutionists, but their methods and specific theories were different to North American anthropologists for especially influential, most uh, writing mostly in the 1940s through the 1960s, Leslie White thought that the 19th century evolutionists got some things right after all. Some components of human cultural existence have in fact improved over the centuries, namely the technologies, tools, techni technical knowledge, skills, 
end quote, <laughs> I'm sorry, that people used to acquire nature's resources. Improved how? Improved in the sense that people with better technologies are able to harness more energy per person per year. That is, some technologies are more productive or efficient than others, so people can produce more useful products with them. Cultural evolution is an objective fact. White argued it occurs as the amount of energy harnessed from the natural environment environment increases. In principle, cultural evolution can be defined without resorting to the ethnocentric assumptions. If true, White overcame one of the historical particularism main objections. Excuse me. White took his argument further. Over long periods of time, as human discovered, discovered and invented new technologies that increased the quantity of energy captured, changes in the organization of society and in the ideas and beliefs of their members followed, to use White's own terminology, improvements in the technological system, changes in the social system and the, ideolo the ideological system. Generally speaking, over time, human social and ideological systems have grown more complex what does complex mean? It means that the scale of societies increases dramatically, occupational specialization develops, large-scale trade and long-distance exchange grow. Political centralization occurs and inequality between classes increases. When be White believed that improvements in technology and the resulting increase in the ability of people to harness and harness energy caused most important changes in human cultures. For example, he argued that the transition to agriculture caused civilization to develop some regions and the discovery of how to harness the energy of coal. I'm sorry. energy caused most important changes to human cultures. For example, he argued that the transition to agriculture caused civilization to develop in some regions and the discovery of how to harness energy of coal caused the rise of industrial society in Great Britain. For this reason, White is often called a technological determinist, meaning he believed that technology causes, determines, almost everything else in culture that is important. What causes changes in aspects of culture, like family organization and political structures. To white, these were per part of the social system, and they largely responded to changes in technology. What about aspects of culture, like religion, philosophy, worldview, and art? To White, these were part of the ideological system, and by and large, they changed the, to reflect and justify changes in the social system. In summary, White boldly generalized that as technology develops, the social system evolves to take advantage of the increased energy available, and new ideological ideologies arise to explain and justify the new technological and social arrangements. So cultural evolution is in fact a regular pattern process about which anthropologists can generalize by making objective comparisons and contrast. Each culture is not entirely unique and we can legitimately provide explanations that do not depend on the native's point of view. White agreed with E.B. Taylor that anthropology should be the science of culture, and White made this the title of a book he published in 1949. Let me go ahead and do that so you can see the non-evolutionism. Julian Stewart was a contemporary of White who agreed that how a people acquire natural resources and cope with their environment is the most important part of their way of life. But more than White, Stewart's theory emphasized the na natural environment which provided food, fuel, 
water, and other necessary resources. In his study of the, New, the Numic peoples of the, of the Great Basin, Stewart investigated how food resources were distributed seasonally and geographically. He argued that much of the culture of the Shoshone and other Numic peoples could be explained by how they scheduled their work and movements to take advantage of the availability of food. Stewart's ideas eventually gave rise to the modern field of ecological anthropology, which studies how humans relate to the environment. We discussed the general, excuse me, we discussed the general results of, of such studies in chapter seven. Men like White and Stewart made attempts to explain culture in scientific terms of respectable again. For White, the general principle of needed to explain cultural evolution is technological de determinism. For Stewart, the complicated interactions between hum humans and the natural environments are the most important causes of cultural differences and similarities. White and Stewart are two of the most important intellectual ancestors of the various scientific approaches in Western anthropology today. Anthropological thought today. Boas's early criticism of the unilineal evolutionists illustrate a continuing controversy. First, the unilineal evolutionists thought that anthropology should be like the natural sciences in its goal. goals. Their goal was to discover the general principle, laws, that govern cultural development. In contrast, the historicists mistrusted most generalizations, especially broad and sweeping ones like all cultures pass through similar stages. The closer you come to getting inside another culture, they argued, the more details you perceive and hence the more different it looks from other cultures. Most similarities are only superficial, like the similarity between polytheism in ancient Polynesia and Greece. In discovering similarities, you tend to, to neglect differences. Second, the evolutionist uncritically placed similar cultures in the same stage of pro progress, like the Iroquois and the Fijians, both placed in barbarism. But the historics Historicists insisted that the evolutionist idea of progress was ethnocentric and that therefore stages were artificial creations. There are no universal stages or even widespread stages than the regularities of cultural development. That the 19th century scholars were not real, but only the result of their ethnocentric assumptions and faulty methods. Third, the evolutionists compared and contrasted cultures from all parts of the world and found customs they considered the same among widely scattered peoples, but the historicist reasons reason that because each culture's history is different from the history of every other culture, it follows that each culture is unique and distinctive. It is misleading to place customs and beliefs from several cultures into the same category because there are in the fact subtle differences between them. For example, if you say that the ancient Polynesians and Greeks have the same form of religion, which you label as polytheism, the label is yours, not theirs. To call the two religions the same is to misrepresent them. The people believed in different gods, not the same ones, and the gods did different kinds of things. And to people, saying they are the same form denies their religions and the people who believes and practice them. Their distinctiveness, <clears throat> it denies the others their own voices. It privileges the voice of anthropologists, meaning that is that it implicitly assumes that anthropologists' ideas are more valid than 
the ideas of others about what they do and how they think. It is impossible here to discuss all the issues that concern cultural anthropologists in the first 21st century. Instead, we concentrate on a few major but related questions. Can and should cultural anthropology be science in the same sense that biology is a science? What are the most useful concepts and theoretical orientations to use in studying human cultural diversity? When we conduct field work in another culture, should the field worker decide what is important? What is, should anthropologists define the questions and purpose, propose the answers? Or should the views of others, of the others themselves take precedence? That is, should the native's point of view take priority? <clears throat> Can an outsider even ever grasp the native's point of view? Do the native, natives even agree to, on their point of view? One important division today is between cultural anthropologists whose interests and methods are more similar to science and those who, whose interests and methods are more humanistic. These two generalized approaches are fo our focus for discover discussion. Oh, I can't talk, I'm sorry. For discussing anthropological thought today, scientific approaches. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those who adopt a scientific approach seek to discover <clears throat> the general forces that make cultures the way they are or were. That is, they want to explain human. Oh, I hate it does it. Here's the vocabulary word. They want to explain ways of life as well as researching of specific other others scientifically oriented anthropologists are interested in human culture in general meaning they want to discover whether they are in are any general principles laws eb tyler called them the effect all peoples they are interested in big questions what are the primary causes of social and cultural differences and similarities what makes social make, what makes societies and cultures change and or change at different rates? What are the relationships among the major components of a people's way of life, such as acquiring resources, family organization, political structure, and religious beliefs and rituals? When two cultures come to into contact, what kinds of forces affect the outcome? Given the complexity of human humanity and even single culture, the answer is always going to be, it all depends. Scientifically oriented scholars agree, but ask on what mainly. If the answer turns out to be on everything else, then the scientific approach probably will not be able to achieve its goals. There can never be a general theory that answers their big questions because the word theory implies that only a few general principles or forces are reasonable for most of the important differences, changes, relationships, and other phenomena. However, if cultures are indeed products of everything that happened in the past, then there are no general and important processes that operate widely in most societies most of the time. Human existence would be too chaotic and random and to be explained by any general theory. Scientifically oriented anthropologists agree that cultures are complicated and subject to random forces, but they hold the most that the most important forces are not random. Instead, they operate widely and powerfully in this respect. They follow the tradition of the unilineal evolutionists and the non-evolutionists. Here we consider the only two scientific approaches, evolutionary psychology, 
to do after that. So you can pause that. In the late 1970s, some anthropologists adopted a theory known as socio sociobiology. Social scientists now usually call it evolutionary psychology. It emphasizes the similarities between humans and other animals, arguing that humans are subject to the same kinds of processes that operate in other animals. Harvard biologist Edward O'Neill Wilson is instrumental in developing this theoretical framework in the biological sciences. Wilson was interested in animal social behavior. For example, why do so many animals, e.g. lions, ants, many ungulates, live in herds or other groups whose members help one another by cooperating? In hunting or emitting alarm calls that warn the group of a nearby predator, why are such behaviors puzzling? Most biologists have long believed that natural selection usually produces organisms that are gen genetically selfish, unselfish, altruistic. Behavior in animals is rare, existing only under very special circumstances. For instance, most cooperative social behaviors, such as calls to warn others of predators, are costly to the individual animal, yet the benefits accrue to the groups to the group a prairie dog calling to alert its neighbors to a predator might call the predator's attention to itself and thus stand a greater chance of getting eaten how could natural selection produce of produce animals that act altruistically when the altruistic behavior is so costly to the altruistic animal natural selection should select against altruism because an altruistic animal will have a le less chance of survival and reproduction than the selfish ones. Wilson, along with other biologists such as Richard Dawkins and William Hamilton, solved this puzzle by noting that the beneficiaries of altruistic behaviors are not individual organisms, but genes. Because genes are the units of, that are transmitted to offspring, through reproduction, only genes that reproduce more reproduce more copies of themselves in the next generation can survive. Sociobiologists argue that genes tend to program the bodies that temporarily house them to act in ways that improve their biological fitness. That is, in ways that to that increase their frequencies in the next generation. To paraphrase, Dawkins, a body and its behavior are genes' way of making more copies of itself. Some evolutionary psychologists claim that this statement applies to humans as well as to other animals. Taken seriously and applied to humans, potentially this means that your body and behavior are more genes way of making more copies of themselves here you can understand why some believe that evolutionary psychology is not relevant for humans whose thoughts and behaviors are socially learned rather than inherent inherited genetically on the other hand most certainly the genetic makeup of humanity makes some things easier to learn than others you can you also can imagine that genes make some things more likely to persist over generations, namely those things that enhance survival and reproduction. Another way this is that genes might bias what people are learn, prone to learn. Excuse me. The main contribution of evolutionary psychology is the insight of the, that the fitness of an individual animal is enhanced if it aids a relative that shares a, the gene for altruism. The principle is most apparent in parents aiding, feeding, protecting, teaching their offspring. However, it also applies to other relatives. 
For example, a female can potentially increase her fitness if she aids her brother. If that brother carries the same gene by helping her brother, she herself may reproduce less, but this cost can be more than offset if her help substantially improves her brother's chances of transmitting that gene to his offspring. Thus, natural selection increases the survival of any gene that programs its body to help a relative. If the cost in fitness to the gene is lower than the benefit of the same gene housed in the relative's body, so an individual animal can behave altruistically, but only if the benefit of the altruistic act helps a relative more than its cost. The altruistic truest note that the behavior is not truly altruistic because it increases the fitness of the gene that causes it. Some anthropologists believe that such ideas in con ideas contribute to explaining human social behavior. For example, you and I have a genetic interest in the welfare of our relatives. All else equal, the more closely related we are, the most we care for them. And people care for most for those individuals who are the main vehicles for transmitting their genes. Their own offspring and offspring's offspring we care little or less for non-relatives and will assist them only if they somehow return benefits to us or it, to our relatives. They do this mainly by reciprocal, I cannot pronounce this word, I'm so sorry, reciprocity. That is, they return our help immediately or at some later time if we cannot count on their presence and help in the future. Evolutionary psychologists claim that selfishness motivates most human actions, although the selfish motive is sometimes disguised when we help family members or friends in ex expectations or of future returns. More generally, evolutionary psychologists note that for most of human history, the most important human groups, bands discussed in later chapters, were composed mostly of relatives who cooperated in foraging, food sharing, child care, and other activities. They also point out that far more human societies allow a man to have survival wives than allow a woman to have several husbands, which is consistent with soci sociobiology, see chapter nine. They claim that evolutionary psychology helps explain many of the following widespread human mental and behavioral predispositions. Xenophobia, we may hate or mistrust strangers who belong to other races or ethnicities because as obvious, non-relatives, we cannot trust them and any help we give them is unlikely <clears throat> to be reciprocated. Some say this helps explain the ethnocentrism. Warfare, braver or stronger men who protect the group are more likely to attract more wives and ha or have more sex and hence more offspring. Some believe this helps explain why so many cultures reward warriors. Male unfaithfulness to wives. Extramarital sexual relationships allow males to have more children and therefore more fitness without the cost of raising the children. Some think it, uh, this accounts for why men in most societies are allowed to have more than one wife while having more than one husband. Well, I'm sorry. While having more than one husband is rare, a rare marriage form. Female preference for marrying high status wealthy males. Women get access to more resources, though such marriages thus improving their survival chances and ultimately the fitness of their offspring. Some claim this insight explains why women prefer to marry up the social ladder in societies where one exists. Revenge motives. Some is likely Someone is likely to attack you or your group. Uh, the person knows you are likely to retaliate. 
that you are honor bound to avenge the death. Some believe, some believe that the death penalty in many nation states does not actually deter violent crimes, but it is really about the retribution that benefited our ancestors. Critics of such ideas charge that these people, that these and other social, so-called predispositions are more the product of socialization than of genes because they vary from people to people. Even if evolutionary psychology helps in understanding which such widespread patterns Critics say that it tells us little or nothing about the reasons different peoples exhibit them strongly, weakly, or not at all. So the help is minimum at best. It may even be harmful if it makes us erroneously, I'm so sorry, erroneously believe we now understand something. And at any rate, the insights of the sociobiology applied primarily if all is equal, unquote, which is rarely the case. Finally, many self-sacrificial acts of devotion by individuals such as suicide bombers and kamikaze pilots who kill themselves out of the devotion of their faith, values, or homeland are problematic for evolutionary psychology unless their close kin receive some benefits in fitness. Numerous other arguments exist both for and evo against evolutionary psychology, some of which we <clears throat> cover in later chapters. For now, note that it is an excellent example of the scientific side of cultural anthropology. It holds that people are subject to the same principles and pressure as other animals, and most importantly, it forces to the forces of natural selection. Materialism, another modern scientific approach, <clears throat> more popular than the evolutionary psychology, is materialism, also called cultural materialism. Like Malianowski, this approach argues that the satisfaction of human material needs and desires is the most important influence on how societies are organized and on what people think and believe. People face similar material needs to, as do all animals. We must receive adequate intakes of food and water, regulate our body temperature by building shelters and wearing clothing reproduce, cope with organisms that cause disease, compete successfully, and so forth. To satisfy these needs efficiently, people have to organize their societies in certain ways to cooperate their, to, or to succeed in competition with other societies. Many other elements of a people's culture are determined by or are greatly influenced by how people organize their activities to survive and persist on their in their environments. Materialistic claim. At root, materialists think that how a people make their living in their environment is the most important influence on the rest of their cultural existence. If, a, if relationships with the environment and acquiring material resources are primarily then primary then those aspects of culture of culture that help acquire resources strongly affect all their aspects far more than any other animal people depend on technology to exploit the resources compete with other groups and to cope with other problems of environmental adaptation Technology includes not just physical instruments, the tools used to produce food, provide shelter, and generally cope with the environment. Equally important, technology includes the knowledge, skills about the environment, about resources, and about the manufacture and effective use of tools that people have socially learned from the previous generations. Because humans rely on tools and knowledge to acquire food and harness other resources, 
Technology is among the most important aspects of culture everywhere. Materialists believe a people's technology strongly affect other parts of their culture, including family life, political organization, values, and even worldviews, much as White argued in the 1940s. Yet most materialists of today disagree with White's view that increased energy capture made possible by technological improvements has generally made human life better and resulted in progress. In contrast to White, most modern materialists believe technological changes have improved the lives of some people in some respects, but that changes in technology have had mixed results overall. I'm going to go ahead and go on the By emphasizing the importance of phys physical, biological needs, technology, technology environment, and sorry, population size, modern materialists resemble earlier thinkers such as Milan, Malinowski, White, and Stewart. However, modern materialists emphasize interrelationships between people and environments. For the most part, early theories about causation were linear, meaning that one thing makes another thing the way it is, thus A causes B or A determines B. But materialists of today are more likely to view technology, environment, population, and culture as having feedback relationships with one another. That is, as their numbers increase, people interact with their environment in new ways, and so change the environment. In turn, these changes, this changes the way people live, and so on over long per time periods. An important process for many materialists is the intensification. As human numbers grow in a region, people modify uh, more and more of the natural environment in order to produce greater quantities of food and other material needs. Usually intensification involves greater and or more extensive modification and or destruction of some parts or of natural environment. For example, as people exploit a resource, they may deplete its supply. Future generations must then work harder to acquire the same resource, develop a new method of acquiring it, or switch to an alternative resource. Other cultural changes accompany this long-term process of intensification. If the process is not halted or reversed, we discuss some of these processes in Chapter 7. For now, note three of the main arguments of materialists when many customs and beliefs of a particular culture can be explained by how they help people live in the natural world. Two, population growth and intensification are major factors that lead to cultural change. Three, generally and in the long run, material forces like the nature, natural environment, resources, technologies, and population densities are more important than aspects of cultural knowledge ideas and beliefs, such as values, symbols, and worldviews, humanistic approaches. Many ideas of both evolutionary psychology and materialism are not seriously questioned. Most people transmit their genes by having children, and most of us are more likely to help relatives than strangers. But whether biologically, the biologically determined predisposition, dispositions identified by evolutionary psychology really are important causes is debatable. Some deny that such universal human predispositions exist at all. Some say that even if such predispositions do exist, then explaining them has it the effect of justifying racial hatreds, violence, sexual inequalities, and the like. The very notion of hum that human beings are in innately selfish 
is odious to many anthropologists. Likewise, clearly people have material needs, but whether such needs are basic and whether they shape all of, the, of human existence is debatable. Some think humans differ from other animals in that the needs, <clears throat> these needs can be satisfied in such a multitude of ways that cultural differences cannot plausibly be reduced to material need and want satisfaction. They are skeptical that material factors cause cultural differences and similarities and long-term changes. In fact, they doubt that any general explanation applies to human cultures. Many believe that any scholar who tries to explain cultural dehuman de culture dehumanizes people by treating them as objects. Most scholars who adopt the humanistic approach doubt or deny that any single theory can explain culture in the same way that the evolutionary theory explains life or that Einstein's relativity theory explains the physical world. Humanistic anthropologists are skeptical of general theories for many reasons. One is that humanity's social and cultural words, worlds are just too complicated for one theory to explain them. All those cultures of all those others cannot be reduced to a single for formula, they claim. Humanistic scholars say that another reason for rejecting general theories is the uniqueness of humanity. Homo sapiens is such a special kind of animal that the methods and analysis, analysis that biology uses to explain other life forms do not apply to us in any significant respect. Human uniqueness lies mainly in our heavy dependence on social learning and our capacity for complex communication. That is, in both culture and language, other animals live in the natural world with the food sources, predators, mates, and other potential mates, and so forth. Of course, humans also eat, drink, sleep, and engage in sex. But humanists point out we also live in a cultural world. What, when, and how we eat, drink, sleep, and have sex are largely determined by the culture into which we, each of us, happens to have been born. People live in the natural world, but we also culturally construct the natural world and have a world view, see chapter two. Our constructions are, are, and worldviews are as important in affecting our behaviors, thoughts, and feelings as living in the world world itself, humanists claim. Language also makes us unique. Humanities say language provides words with what, which we classify and categorize objects, people, events, actions, qualities, and so forth. Because of language, we construct categories of events, people, groups, objects, plants, and so on, which vary from culture to culture. Because of its displacement property, see chapter three, language and even provides us with words for things that have no material existence at all, such as ghosts and demons, and such beliefs affect our behavior, sometimes dramatically if the superior wharf hypothesis has any validity and generality, then our language conditions our perceptions of the world itself. So every people exist in a perceived world that is unique to them. These features of language are all unique to humanity and because of them we create our own reality as well as respond to actual reality. All of this seems to imply that humans' reactions to the natural environment and human beliefs about the world are products of culture and language. To humanistic anthropologists, at the most material factors like environment, technology, and population affect culture only by limiting, constraining how a people act, think, and feel. Material factors cannot determine cause, action, thoughts, 
and feelings because of these factors themselves are in part products of actions, thoughts, and feelings, neither causes or explains the other, which makes untangling causes and effects pretty much impossible, argue humanistic anthropologists to the materialistic's claim that nature's resources are important influences on cultures and societies. A critical humanistic humanist may respond that resources are not entirely natural. Consider food resources, for instance, which materialists believe are among the most important influences on cultures based on religious prohibitions and cultural notions of what is edible and what is not. Various people refuse to eat cattle, pigs, dogs, horses, and insect larvae. These, including the larvae, are the same flesh considered so delicious by some other peoples. Cultures have food taboos that are based on something besides nutritional considerations. Go ahead and do that because it's gonna For example, in 2012, the British peoples were outraged when it was reported that some beef products also contained horse meat. Although their fellow Europeans, <clears throat> the French freely buy horse meat if food and other resources are culturally defined and culturally meaningful as well as biologically nutritious, then in human life, is food is culturally defined not given by the environment. Long ago, our cultural ancestors built culturally constructed the cultural world in which we live our lives. We live within this cultural world as well as within our, the natural one, humanistic, humanists point out. Thus, some humanist, humanistic anthropologists think that Tyler and White's science of culture is not possible. Humans and their societies are too complex and too diverse, and humans live partly in worlds that their language and culture construct for them. Some humanistic anthropologists do not believe that anthropology should even try to be scientific. In their, their view, scientific anthropology objectifies cultures, that is, in its efforts to generalize science places, cultural features and features into categories, e.g. forms of marriage, types of religions, and, excuse me, that are categories of the anthropologists, not the, excuse me, not of those, not of the people themselves. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. Humanists often make this point by saying that scientifically oriented anthropologists rob people of their voices. They mean that scientific anthropologists are arrogant to the extent that they believe they know better than up than the others themselves that what is important in their lives and what is was important in shaping their culture. As for research, humanistic anthropologists point out there that field workers carry their own culture with them into their research experiences. The culture affects their interactions with the community including whose stories they believe, which perceptions they consider important, and so forth. Conversely, individuals in the community have their own perceptions, opinions, and biases about field, the field worker, among the many factors that affect how the community reacts are the field worker's physical characteristics, gender, and personality as well as the historical experience of the community with individuals of the anthropolo anthropologist's own society. Most, um, although most field workers attempt the, to overcome their own cultural biases and to fit into the community, complete objectivity is impossible. In fact, many humanists think that any ethnography cannot, cannot be a simple report on facts about a given group. Rather, it is construction, a construction meaning that an ethnography 
is a product of interactions that another field worker would not experience. You might well wonder if all this is true, how is it the, that materialists have been so misguided about the importance of environment, technology, adaptation, and so forth? Some humanistic anthropologists claim that materialists' thinking is a product of Western cultural values and beliefs because the West places of West places such high value on material welfare and consumption. Materialists mistakenly impose these same values and beliefs on other cultures living in a competitive and co capitalistic society predisposes materialists to see economic man in culture where he does not exist. Materialistic, materialist theory is a kind of ethnocentrism they claim. Some materialists respond in kind. They point out that most academics are members of the privileged class in status, wealth, or both. Because most academics, including humanistic anthropologists, so seldom have to worry about filing, filling their stomachs or sheltering themselves from heat, snow, and rain, or protecting themselves from enemies, it is easy for them to believe that such concerns are not important in other cultures either. The humanist failure to realize the broad importance of material, material factors is related to their own wealth and privilege. The humanistic approach is a kind of ethnocentrism, some claim. Even more than the scientific approach, it is difficult or impossible to collapse humanistic anthropology into a few schools or ways of approaching others. Here we discuss only two. Interpretive anthropology became popular in the 1960s, whereas postmodernism has become influential since the 1980s. <clears throat> Interpretive anthropology. Interpretive anthropology emphasizes the uniqueness of each culture. Each culture has its own way ways of doing things, its own worldview, its own values, and so forth. Even if two or more cultures look similar, close examination usually shows that the meanings they attach to other behaviors, such objects and concepts are different. This uniqueness makes comparison be comparisons between different cultures misleading. In this and other respects, Interpretive anthropology is similar to historical partic particularism, and because science attempts to generalize through comparisons and contrast, it follows that anthropology is more of a humanistic discipline than a scientific one. It has more in common with literature and art than with biology or psychology, according to the interpretive approach. Interpretive, excuse me, interpretive, Anthropologists emphasize the symbolic dimensions of a particular culture. All social behavior has a symbolic component in the sense that participants constantly must behave in ways others will understand. All social interaction, therefore, is symbolic and meaningful. Meanings exist only by virtue of common agreement with among the parties to the interaction whether the interaction involves making conversation, making change in a store, or making an iPhone at a plant in Southern China, neither participant can tell an observer how he or she knows what the other participant means by this or that behavior. Yet participants behave in many ways that others understand and they constantly interpret the behavior of others correctly. The job of the anthropologist is not to explain elements of a culture to culture, but to ex explicate one element through the others. 
that is anthropologist shows how one things in a cultural system makes sense in terms of other things in the same system because interpretation is seeing how things make sense when understood in their context. Anagonously, a dictionary explicit, explicates the meaning of words in terms of other words. Only if one knows the meanings of many words in the dictionary can one use them to decipher the meanings of unknown words. We seek to understand a people's way of life as they understand it. The late Clifford Geertz, 1983, page 58, who shaped the interpretive approach, used Melanowski's words when he wrote that anthropologists sh should seek to grasp the native point of view and to figure out what the devil they think they are up to. This involves acquiring intimate knowledge of a particular culture so that the ethnographer can make sense of the culture for those who do not know it. Most interpretivists are uninterested in comparison because the meanings of actions, objects, events, and social relationships are too diverse for comparisons to be valid. According to many interpretive anthropologists, the search for generalized explanations of human ways of life is futile. So many factors contributed to the formation of a culture and these factors interacted in such complex and unpredictable ways that we must concentrate on understanding the uniqueness of I'm so sorry, unique elements of each way of life. In this respect, interpretive anthropologist exemplifies the humanistic perspective. Here's the vocabulary word. Postmodernism. Postmodernism generally maintains that me the methods and assumption of all science, including fields such as biology, are themselves culturally situated. This means that science, as most people understand it, as not objective in its theories and even in its facts, data. Rather, it is conducted by scientists who are products of a particular cultural upbringing. Like all knowledge, scientific theories are affected by conditions in the scientist's own culture. For example, a postmodernist might say that evolutionary psychologists are encultured into a culture that practically celebrates selfishness. In free market economies, everyone is supposed to be looking out for themselves and consuming commodities and competing. So the evolutionary psychologists raised in this economic system mistakenly believe people everywhere that act as act this way and claim that these alleged biological imperatives apply to humanity in general. Such theories are cultural bound in the same way that the Boas showed the unilineal evolutionism was cultural bound ethnocentric. If all this is true, how can the proponents of science be so misguided? Postmodernists point out that scientific thinking and methods became prominent during the Enlightenment period, also called the Age of Reason of the late 18th and 19th century. Western Europe Enlightenment philosophers emphasized rational thought as the key of, to advancing knowledge about the world from the solar system up to humanity. Tradition and especially religion were viewed as impediments to discovering the truth, discovering truth. Emotions could also get in the way, especially if they keep otherwise rational thinkers from expecting the reality of a fact or a principle just because they do not like, like it or its implications. For example, you might refuse to accept evidence showing that not all societies are patriarchal. You reject or discount the evidence because it is not consistent with who, what or what you learned while growing up or what you think your religion teaches. 
Your refusal to accept the evidence is not rational, so it gets in the way of improving your knowledge. This would not matter very much for your society unless, of course, men hold the power in that society and most of them feel and believe you, as you do. Enlightenment thinkers try to free the thought from the shackles of religion and emotion so that reason and science could reveal the world to us as it really is. Here's the vocabulary word for this. Postmodernists do not think there is anything very special about the Enlightenment version of rational thought. They say that human knowledge originates in a particular social, economic, and political context. Scientific knowledge is no exception. Science is a product of a particular cultural tradition, that of Western civilization, and therefore reflects the economy, family organization, political ideology, worldview, and so forth of Western society. Science is one of, is one among hum, hundreds of the other systems of cultural knowledge. At the extreme, postmodernists hold that science has little more claim to absolute truth than the ideas and beliefs of other peoples. All are valid on their own terms, but none is privileged or has any exclusive claim objective, objectively Activity. If scientists themselves do not realize this, it is because they are inside their own knowledge system and so fail to grasp the implicit assumptions of their rationalistic and mechanistic worldview. Postmodernists also think the most important thing about the context of knowledge is power relationships. Prevalent beliefs and ideas in a community reflect power relationships largely because of those because those with power have the most to influence on which ideas and beliefs become prevalent. To illustrate with a modern example, most North Americans attach positive value to abstractions like private property, free market capitalism, the rule of law and various individual rights and freedoms, these values reflect and support the interests of some people over other people. A lot of scholarly knowledge, including much of what is taught in colleges and universities, is like this postmodernist claim. For example, evolutionary psychology is often taught as a credible or even correct theory in biology courses. Although many postmodernists believe its theories support sexism and patriarchy, in anthropological fieldwork, there is often a power dimension to the relationship between the field worker and the local people. Most field workers are able to command more resources and thus can influence people to talk about things they would rather not discuss. Despite published ethical standards in field work covered in chapter six, postmodernists tend to mistrust older ethno ethnographies and generally they prefer accounts in which field workers openly discuss their personal relationships with members of, of the community. They also prefer ethnographies in which ethnograph ethnographer gives her or his readings to local voices. As, mission, as mentioned, postmodernism penetrated anthropology in the 1980s and has attracted more converts in our dis discipline than any other social science. One reason for, this, for the popularity of this perspective in anthropology is its apparent consistency with cultural relativism. However, critics approach the Critics of the approach became vocal in the late 1990s. How have their own ideas escaped the influence of power relationships? Why wouldn't their ideas be culture bound as well? Postmodernism reminds us that rationality 
and science do not provide all the answers and do not ask many relevant questions. It leads us to ask where our ideas come from and who might gain and lose from them. Perhaps most important, it warns anthropolo anthropological thinkers of the dangers of becoming arrogant about our objectivity. Scientific orient scientifically oriented theorists might forget that they are cultural beings and their, that their own ideas about the human world are culturally conditioned. The concept review features, features sharply contrasts the main differences between the scientific and the humanistic approaches. Notice that they differ in their concept in the, of their primary goals of anthropology and the significance of humanity's bio, biology for anthropological research and findings and the validity of conducting cross-cultural comparisons in whether anthropological research among humans can be objective and in the appropriate aims of conducting fieldwork. Like most dualistic contrasts, the, the ones in the concept review are presented starkly and there is more overlap between the two approaches than shown, either or, or both. The differences between scientific humanistic orientations are sometimes presented as conflicting. Humanists often accuse scientists of dehumanizing people in their misguided efforts to explain explain them, whereas scientific, scientists claim that humanists are deceiving themselves if they think they can get inside some other culture and grasp the, the native's point of view. A recent controversy illustrates that many anthropologists continue to have contrasting views of what their discipline is or should be. Until 2010, the American Anthropological Association stated that its long-range plan B is to advance anthropology as the science that studies humankind in all aspects. At the 2010 annual meeting of the AAA, however, the executive board revised the plan to state its purpose as to advance public understandings of humankind in all its aspects. The replacement of science with public understanding led to strong reactions from the scientifically oriented anthropologists who felt the official statement under mind their perspective. Here's the concept review. So you can, if you wish to take notes. To some extent, different approaches exist because of the difference, differing interests of anthropologists. For example, scholars who res, whose research includes subjects such as human environment relationships, economic systems, or long-term changes in societies are likely to find a materialistic approach useful. Those who study dimensions such as mythology, art, oral traditions, or worldviews are more likely to fail, I'm so sorry, are more likely to fall into humanistic approach, a humanistic camp. So in part, the diversity of modern approaches reflects the fact that human beings and their cultures are complex and multifaceted. The orientation most useful to understand one fact, e.g. substance, may not prove very useful to understand another, e.g. worldview. In the interest of balance, in the remainder of this book, we try to avoid choosing between two orientations by taking the following approach. Like evolutionary psychologists and cultural materialistic, materialists, we think that it is important that people are part of nature, but we recognize that if different elements of a culture are influenced to different degrees by material conditions. The way an economy is organized is greatly influenced by the local environment 
climate, technology, and the size and density of the human population. But the ways the numbers of members of a culture of a culture resolve their disputes, raise their children, perform their rituals, or act their father, their fathers in law are less influenced by material conditions or are influenced by them only directly. Details of the legends they recite, the specific objects they use as religious symbols, and the ways they decorate their bodies may have little or nothing to do with material forces. Such elements of a cultural system are only loosely tied to the natural world and to material needs and wants. We cannot account for them without considering people's desires for a meaningful existence and emotionally gratifying social life, an intellectually satisfying worldview, creative self-expression, and so forth. Different orientations are useful for studying different dimensions of culture. Still, people who are new to anthropology are often puzzled by the diversity of approaches within the field. We therefore conclude this chapter by suggesting answers to the question posed in the following section. Why can't all these anthropo... Anthro why can't, uh, so sorry. It's close to the end, guys. I'm so sorry about that. Why can't all those anthropologists agree? Most scholars in nat nat natural sciences generally agree on a set of laws or principles that govern the aspects of the world they study in geology. For example, processes such as sedimentation, plate tectonics, volcanic eruptions, fossilization, and so forth are likely well understood and account for the main geological features of our planet. Biologists likewise believe that the process of evolution produced but the diversity of all life on Earth. Although the relative importance of natural selection and random events in this process remain uncertain, cultural anthropology lacks a comparable set of general world principles. Why can't anthropologists agree more than we do? Several factors contribute to the absence of consensus. First, humans are conscious and self-aware beings who state a variety of reasons for why we do not, for why we do what we do and think what we think. The zoologist studying in an animal's behavior observes and records the behaviors and then typically tries to identify the elements of the natural and social environment to which the behavior is adapted but the anthropologist must listen to the reasons people themselves give their behavior. People talk back and anthropologists must take their talk as well as their actions into account. Second, for ethical reasons, anthropologists do not set up controlled experiments to study how people respond. Suppose Following Stewart's lead, we want to study how the natural environment affects cultures. We cannot hold everything constant except the supply of food, water, or shelter, and then we see how people react when the supply of food, water, or shelter is varied. Anthropologists do not control the conditions under which different people, peoples live their lives. The best way we can do is look around the world for natural experiments places where the natural environment is similar to and peoples with different histories live. We can choose a sample of people, peoples who live in environments that appears to be, appear to be similar, and then we see whether the peoples who live in these places have similar cultures. For example, we might compare indigenous people, peoples who live in the world's deserts of the Sahara, Sahara of Northern Africa, the Kalahari of Southern Africa, the American Southwest, the Gobi of Central Asia, and so forth to conduct such a comparative study. We would have to rely on the ethnographic reports written by a multitude of earlier ethnographers whose resu reports resulted from their observations and discussions with peoples in the various deserts. Suppose our comparative study finds as it 
will that the cultures are similar in some respects, but different in others. Then other problems arise. Natural environments are only similar, never identical. Did we fail to conduct, to detect a small but critical difference in the environment that might explain the cultural differences or the differences due to the non-environmental factors? Likewise, shall we call customs and beliefs that differ in minor ways between the cultures <clears throat> the same or the subtle differences between them sufficient to call them different? Suppose we observe that desert people share food within their villages, but then we discover that people in several of the cultures gave different reasons for behavior in culture X. People say they want to help one another, whereas in culture Y, they say they, they give only because they expect to give, get something back later. Are both of these behaviors still sharing food? Or should we consider them different because people's stated motivations differ? Such questions are inherently difficult to answer when dealing with human beings. And anthropologists cannot sort them out in laboratories or other experimental settings. Quite likely, a third re reason anthropology lacks a common theoretical orientation is because people become anthropologists for a wider variety of reasons than people become, say, physicists or physicists. Some of us study anthropology because of our curiosity about why the human species is so diverse culturally. Others go into catting themselves and others about racism, ethnicism, colonial, colonialism, or sexism, for example. Some want to immerse themselves in travel and interaction with the people who are different from themselves. And they become anthropologists because the field provides them with such opportunities. The very broad scope of anthropology, see chapter one, helps account for the variety of reasons people choose it as a career. You can study agriculture, family, life, political organization, medicine, art, religion, folklore, and almost, almost anything else having to do with humankind. Naturally, people who study the topics as diverse as their, these are unlikely to agree on their theoretical orientations to the field as a whole. Indeed, many of them consciously reject any form of theoretical orientation, preferring to con concentrate on researching particular cultures. And some, there are at least three major modern cultural anthropologists have such varied orientations to the study of culture. Number one, our subjects, other, other human beings, are conscious beings who are aware of their own behavior and state of their own reasons for why they do what they do. Human subjects talk back. Two, anthropologists cannot set up experiments that enable them to control the conditions under which people live. Anthropologists observe people as they live their everyday lives. Three, the broad scope of the field and the enormous diversity of reasons people study anthropology make it unlikely to achieve theoretical consensus. Cultural anthropologists are among the most diverse as scholars. Here's the summary. And by the way, this is the end of chapter five. Thank you.